Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision. Can I start with asking you to explain your passion for cricket with someone who doesn't know much about cricket? Yeah, so it's essentially when I was a kid, um, I was quite an anxious kid. We lived in a... uh, um, a part of Cairns in far north Queensland that was very remote and I didn't have many friends around at that stage and and uh, I was crying all the time when I was a kid and mum and dad took me to a child psychologist and and I remember standing outside the uh, the you know the waiting I was in the waiting room but mum and dad were in there talking to the, to the psychologist and the psychologist said what well, you know do you have any theories on what might be what might be wrong with Adam and dad said, well, he does eat a lot of honey. <laughs> and that was, that was his only kind of his, his mental health response. <laughs> um, but uh, soon after, and they suggested, she suggested that, that, that I'd be taking camping and things like that and, you know, do extracurricular activities. But it wasn't until I just discovered cricket uh, that I felt that anxiety calm and, I, uh, you know, and I really kind of, you know, in the way that a lot of people have with hobbies or passions that, you know, I, I just threw myself into it and learned everything I could about the cricketers and, and, uh, watched every game Australia played. And, um, and I found whenever I did that, that my anxiety kind of calmed down and, and it's been like that ever since really. So that's, that's my, that's my entry into the, into the game. But why cricket? Like, why not some other sport? Like, what was it about cricket that captured your imagination? Well, you know, if we're if we're going to stay on the mental health track, it's a very meditative sport. Mm-hmm. It's a, you know, it's a it's quite a calming sport. If you're in the zone and you know what's going on, then you just it, you, you your pulse rate will go will go right down. And then there's moments of the drama and drama. It's great, and you know, and then and then it, it brings you back down again. So I. I love the characters. I love the pace of it. Um, I love the narrative over fight, especially test cricket with the, because, you know, it's, that's my job is to tell stories. So I love the, the story over five days and the structure of, of, of that. I think um, it's very hard to know. It's very hard to plot bust a test match, you know, so that, that's, that's what appeals to me too, I think. And how do you feel about the Ashes coming up? Well, it's going to be really interesting. I can't pick a winner, really. So, yeah, I, and especially with the, this weather event that we're having at, at the moment, mm. it's very much like English um, conditions. So, I uh, yeah, it, I, I just can't can't pick it. I think there's um, both sides have got an amazing bowling attack. So, yeah, it it could go either way. Really could. And do other sports do it for you as well? Yeah, not not in the same way, not not nearly in the same way. But I'm a big sports fan, so you know, I'm interested in all sports. But um, baseball nearly does it for me in the in a similar way. When I lived in America, I, I you know, it had a similar vibe. But football is like high pulse rate, a lot of you know that does not cure my anxiety. In fact, it just increases my anxiety. But I still watch it because I love it. But um, that's AFL. But it's uh, you know, and tennis is is a little bit the same where I'm kind of anxious the whole time, whereas cricket, I'm all right. So, but yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big sports fanatic. You know, I love it all. What did you get up to during lockdown? I I wrote the book. So so that was literally, so from December 2020 is when I started it. Um, Oh, we we moved back from Los Angeles because we were living in Los Angeles um, and we moved back to Australia and within a month or two, I was writing the book. And that took me until October. I've also written a bunch of other scripts at the same time. So it's just been a lot of writing. So it's all right for me. Um, and uh, a lot of writers' rooms now have been on Zoom. So, yeah, it's been very, I mean, and I do voiceovers uh, from the studio that you're seeing now. And so I do that. I can log into any kind of studio around the country. So it's, Lockdown's been okay, and it's just it just meant that the, the the technology that's already there has just just been embraced. And how long have you been writing? 
so my parents were writers and I started probably having a first crack at writing creatively when I was probably 18, 19, writing plays and short stories and things like that. And um, then I went, so I did journalism. So journalism was already always part of my life. But while I was doing journalism at university, I also studied acting. And so I, I guess the thing for me when I, when I left university was that I could always write myself parts because, you know, get, being an actor is hard. And I, you know, would write short films and plays to put myself in. And eventually I just stopped putting myself in them, you know, and I, mm-hmm. and I just wrote them, you know, as a, as a thing in, in, in themselves. And I, I, yeah, so that, that's how writing started for me. It was, was from a performative place. And I find that helps because if you have an acting background, you can, you know, put yourself in all the characters and everything. So that, that it gives it a bit of truth, a bit of resonance when you when you can actually do that. Mm. Yeah. So you know, I'm I'm speaking the characters aloud a lot when I'm when I'm writing and things like that. So yeah, that that's where the writing comes from. That's the genesis of it. What was your first job, Adam? My first ever job. I think I was a dishwasher, and uh, I was a dishwasher <laughs> at the Cairns International Hotel. And uh, I I wash dishes all around cans, <laughs> um, and then um, apart from journalism, acting, screenwriting, filmmaking, I guess you could say, TV making, film and TV making. My other job was um, I you know I write about this in the book. I, I drove escorts, I drove sex workers. Yes, I saw yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> and where where was that? That was in Melbourne, in, mm. in Melbourne's east, and you got 25 bucks a job, uh, and it was really easy until it got really dangerous. And, you know, if one of the escorts didn't come out at the appointed time, you had to go in and e- extract them mm. and find a way to do that. So, but it was, you know, I don't think it's a financially viable occupation. I mean, I needed it at the time, but you need to have a good car that's that can sustain all those miles and mine mine couldn't so i only did it for i don't know three months or something Mm. um for as long as my car would sustain it but other than that i think it would have just been too much it's interesting that you know normal cars just can't take that that amount of that amount of driving Um, i'm just saying from a money perspective there (laughs) that's just a money perspective (laughs) what's the best money advice you've ever received uh, I, yeah, you, you're asking the wrong person about money. Um, I'm look. My dad always said uh, to me, "Oh, you want to be an actor? Great, keep earning. You know, you want to do this. You, you want to, you know, you want to write plays. Great, keep earning." So I always had that thing that you know I had to keep earning money, regardless of what crazy creative idea I always ha- I I had, and I had many of them. So you know. I always was working as a, a freelance journalist as I was writing plays or, you know, auditioning for for television and things like that. I was always, uh, you know, it was important to me to keep earning and I've always had that in, in my heart and soul, uh, really. I, I don't know whether it's the kind of the Protestant side of me um, coming through, my my Lutheran ancestors bearing down on me, but I, I, I do have a, a sense that even though I've chosen this, kind of artistic life that I need to earn money all the time. And I, I've never really been one for, uh, even though I have had government funding, it's um, it's not been funding, it's been investment. So with Wilfred, for instance, we more than paid back uh, the original investment from Film Victoria and Screen Australia and same with Lowdown. So what, what happens is they invest a certain amount of money in your, like they might invest $500,000 and then once it, and then that money isn't back uh, via sales. Now they might sell internationally or DVD sales in those days. So you know, the, the only a few productions might do that. You know, but I've always kind of uh, prided myself on the ability of our shows to actually turn a profit 
not obviously I haven't been huge profits or also been in much better shape than I'm in now, but um, yeah, they've always turned a profit. What's the best investment decision you've ever made? Um, well, I was partially involved in this. <laughs> My wife, Amanda, uh, in 2014, saw a property in Lennox Head, which we bought. And we always just thought we'd rent it out or have it as a holiday place or whatever and live in Melbourne or Los Angeles. But when the pandemic happened, we moved back into it. And um, not only was it grateful to have that there, but it was also, <laughs> it's just gone up exponentially in the pandemic. So mm. this area has just exploded. So that's, pr- that's a pretty good investment. Yeah. What's the worst investment decision you've made? Oh, uh, any of the short films that I made in uh, in the 90s. But I, I guess they, they all led me to the moment of being able to actually make, a, make good short films and then have a good TV career. So I guess in a way they were paying for an, they were my apprenticeship. So I would spend, because um, I was working as a freelance journalist and I would spend four to $8,000 or maybe sometimes $12,000 a year on making short films because in those days short films were expensive. You needed to buy the film stock. You needed to buy the cameras that loaded the stock. And Sorry, you needed to rent the cameras that loaded the stock. Mm. And it was, always a very, it was always a very expensive enterprise, which it isn't now. So that, there was that. But, you know, at the time I was thinking just before Wilfred happened, before we made the short film of Wilfred, I made a lot of short films and they were getting better and they were going into better festivals and everything, but I probably spent maybe twenty to thirty thousand dollars and I was and I was about to I was about to turn thirty and I thought, I'm just putting money on the fire here. This is just insane. And then Wilfred happened and then suddenly uh it kind of was all worthwhile, you know. It was like I'd I'd bought myself an apprenticeship, you know, I'd I'd bought myself a career. So silver yeah. lining to that story. <laughs> oh, that is great. And that's true, isn't it? It's that 10,000 hours, you know, you put yeah. into something and you become an expert. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, look, it's 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 hard to keep the faith sometimes because you're just yeah. going, I don't know if this is, am I delusional? Yeah. To what extent am I delusional versus um, is this the right, you know, path to take? Yeah. What's your favourite thing to splurge on? I'm not a... I, I look it's the it would probably be a discounted business class ticket going internationally if i can see something that's just a little a little bit not that much more expensive than premium economy i will take it because i travel a lot and um and i know the difference i always feel a bit guilty though I had to do another, I think, eight hours travelling to get first class on points a couple of years ago, and I was like, worth it, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. If you had $10,000 right now, where would you invest it? Uh, look, I, I, would, I would start, I would do a bit of renovation on this place that we're in now because I think that would increase the value. Uh, yeah, it, that, it, like I think there's a few things around here would turn it from kind of this... <laughs> What well, faux colonial? Uh, just some of the little kind of ornaments around the house, kind of I, I think dated a little bit. And I think if we could fix those, it, the, we'd probably add double our money on that ten thousand, at least. Going back to the last question, do you splurge on any cricket memorabilia? No, I no. The the major thing I would splurge on, especially living in Los Angeles, was cricket related is um ensuring that i can watch cricket wherever i am in the world so there was a thing called willow which is a streaming service which is quite expensive i made sure we had that i've always made sure that we've got every possible situation television wise so i can because that's kind of my career so i don't want to be missing out on stuff any yeah. kind of streaming uh sport or just um, film and television, that's what I splurge on. I, I just, uh, I don't illegally download, but I, I want to, you know, I want to have a- access to everything. Have you met a lot of very famous people who are very passionate about cricket that you might not have met without having that cricket in common? I think a lot of people are drawn 
you know, for, for instance, in my podcast, you know, there's a lot of, or, or agony when, when, when you're in a situation where you're, you're getting kind of high profile guests, uh, there might be some people who go, well, he, he likes his cricket, so he can't be all bad. I think, um, I think Dr. Chris Brown and I bonded a lot on over cricket. Uh, Tim Ross and I have, you know, people just, it, yeah, it, Stephen Fry and I had a lot to talk about when we, I, you know, I interviewed him. And once you're in a, once you're a cricket fan and you can talk at a high level, it's like huge connection straight away. Yeah. And that, that is, that really helps things. So, so yeah, it's, um, it helps me in a, in, a, in an environment where I'm interviewing people. Mm. Um, it's a wonderful connection. And, and I know that, you know, I know a couple of people have gone, to, gone, to, seen my cricket documentaries and things and going, yeah, I want to talk to him. You know, it's great. I do love, I, I do love the, the connection and you, you, I've made a lot of friends online, you know, of people who, you know, documentary makers as, or, or comedians, you know, who with a cricket slant because cricketers are, are cricket fans are a little eccentric. They're not, they're not necessarily blokey like football fans, yeah. you know, there, there's something a little bit like being, it's like being a chess fan or something, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's just, there's a, all of these people at some stage of, they tend to be loners and they find solace in the game. So that's mm -hmm. an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I'm feeling like I'm really missing out now. Um <laughs> <laughs> No, no, not necessarily. <laughs> it just helps. It helps. What would you do if you only had fifty dollars left in the bank? Well, maybe I would buy some flour, milk, eggs, and a pan and and a cooker, maybe some sort of cooker, <laughs> and um, and open a little crepe a crepe stall. And um, I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to have a crepe truck, <laughs> and because uh, you know how in France where you see those crepe trucks where people just and you got condiments there, so you just as a dude who makes the crepes and then they you, you pay five bucks and they take it and they put some jam or honey or syrup on it and off they go. Well, I thought that was a good way of making money. So so a little crepe stand. I, I wouldn't be able to afford the truck with the 50 bucks, but, yeah, a little crepe stand. Do you intend to leave an inheritance? <laughs> Look, um, yeah, I, I don't have any kids. Um, I would give some money to uh, – like a lost cat's home or something like that for, for cats that have uh, um, struggled because I like that have struggled or something, you know, that they can be looked after because I do love cats. They're my, uh, they're, they're my Achilles heel. <laughs> What's been your best money-making career move? Uh, doing the Agony series, I think, because we didn't um, – so the way it works in television is if you've got a big production, then – uh, you, you need to go to many forms of investors to, to, to get it across the line. Agony was, we made the whole series for around six or $700,000. That was, and that was the, and so we were able to just make that series on a license fee from the ABC. And therefore, once we sold them on, sold the series to other countries, then that money went straight into uh, our production house. And it was a, sold all over the world. It was a really popular series. So that was that was probably the best thing that I've I, that I've done. It, you may if you can keep the overheads down on a TV show, yet yet still maintain a certain standard, a good standard of production, mm. then you give yourself a chance of making some money. And can you please finish the sentence? Money makes dot dot dot. Uh, money makes me feel calmer. Money makes me feel less guilty having it there just gives me a break yeah good answer lovely thank you so much for your time Thanks for that, Julia. really great talking to you oh you too you too thank you so much thanks for listening to the friends with money podcast for credible independent and easy to understand financial commentary visit moneymag.com.au